something here. The linkage, cable linkage for the throttle valve has been installed on the transmission. The shifting linkage is up high. So the throttle valve linkage is going to be mounted below and attached to a pan bolt. The cable then runs up to the engine compartment. The other end is connected to the carburetor. Okay, up here, if you take a close look, you'll see the speedometer cable has been connected. Here's another look at the throttle valve cable mounting. And you can see good one, all right. the cross black cross member, the custom cross member made for the EOD transmission. It has a bend toward the back of the car, giving about four, four and a half inches more distance from the engine than the original cross member. Also been installed, and if you look at the wear pattern on the front yoke, where it goes into the tail shaft, you can see where there had been some movement. I wouldn't call wear, but just where the uh, yoke would go in and out of the tail shaft of the C4 tranny. This drive shaft is about a quarter inch longer than it needs to be, but there's enough room for what I can see in the yoke travel to compensate for that. So we're not going to cut it or anything. We're going to leave it the way it was. And the U joints themselves were replaced about two summers ago. So that less than 2,000 miles of them, so no need to replace those front or rear. Is Nick is going to install the starter. Now this spacer plate, separator plate, and the bell housing is formed a little further away from the flex plate than the original bell housing. So we had to replace that separator plate, but the starter motor is the same and it should fit in here pretty nicely. But the idea is to get the starter motor in place before we start to form the new cooling lines that Nick is going to be fabricating and cutting and flaring. Okay, well that looks like it's going to go in very nicely. I shouldn't have said that. You know what's going to happen now. You're going to have a problem now. Doing good. Okay, the rest of this is going to be pretty boring, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off the video. You guys get the idea. We've run into one issue. If you take a look, the starter motor is bolted in, but there is a little bit of a gap between the separator plate and the starter motor housing, even with the top and bottom bolts in place. So we're going to pull this thing out and see if there is a reason for that. Okay, Nick, it seems to have found what's going on with the starter. So what we have here, the hole that the, the, the nose of the starter protrudes through on the plate here is hitting at the top and you can actually see it's starting to bend it in around the case of the transmission. Um, so next step is we're going to pack the inside of this bell housing with some paper towel and get the Dremel out. And we're just going to open this hole up because it only appears to be hitting here. So we're going to open this radius up probably a third of the way up to this transmission case a little bit. And that should hopefully solve our issue. Now the other thing you could try first if you want, if you want to get physical with it, you get a long drift and a hammer, just peed it up there a little bit. That would give us the clear because there's nothing there that's going to obstruct. It's just open air behind the plate at the lip there, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, up to you completely. If you'd rather drum out, that's fine. If you want to just go make some noise, that's fine too. But yeah, I definitely see where the housing is interfering with a not completely properly cut separator plate. 
these things happen with stuff like this. There we go. Folding that separator plate up, and once the separator plate is folded up, we'll do another test, and hopefully it'll fit much better. Yeah, we're doing form fitting. <laughs> Also, be careful doing this because you're hammering on an aluminum ear. So you don't want to hit it too hard. If you have access to a brass punch, use a brass punch. Because if you break that ear off, that's a very crucial part. Then you're down to one bolt that holds the starter in. Yeah. And that's not going to work. Yep. Okay, we'll do a test fit and we'll see. Yeah, we still have some more on my side of the arc. Okay, I'm gonna beat on that a little more. Okay, another test fit. Now that some more of the separator plate has been hammered away. Oh, perfect. There you go. That's what we're after. That looks really good. gap at the top okay this time for sure I'll stop recording the starter being installed because at this point now there's nothing exciting left okay, what Nick is doing now is he's starting to form the cooling line for the transmission and what I did not show yet but I will on the next video is him doing what's called a double flare end it's a special kind of flaring at the end of the tubing so that it'll seat without having to use a gasket leak free for hydraulic and air systems. And then you put an initial bend in here using a tubing bender. You don't just bend these things by hand because it can cause problems if it's a tight bend. We're using a nickel copper alloy tubing which is designed for use with hydraulic and air systems unlike straight copper it's a lot stronger and it's not liable to split or burst or corrode and yet it is still pliable enough to allow a person to form a tube as we put it back toward the transmission to one of the cooling line ports. Very easy to work with. Of course, it'd be better if we had a preformed tube, but we don't. The new tubes go in a different area of the transmission for the cooling lines. At least one of them is way different. Hard to see, but at the very end of this nickel copper alloy tube, Nick did a flare on that end, even though it is going to be connected to rubber. The idea is to slide the rubber over that and pinch it tight with a clamp, and it will help keep the rubber from ever blowing off the end of the tube. Okay, Nick is going to go ahead and do a double flare on this nickel copper tubing. He's already put the anchor saddle in place, tightened it down so it doesn't slip. Now he's going to put a little 
saddle inside here. He's got to deburn it first. After using a tubing cutter to cut this, you don't use a hacksaw to cut this tubing. Use a tubing cutter. It gives a nice, clean, squared off cut. And then the little saddle goes in here. And he's going to go ahead and tighten that thing on down. When he does that, it's going to give the end of the tube a bulbous shape. And the pencil end of the ram that he's twisting down there is smooth chrome plated, so it will give a smooth finish to the tubing itself, which is important. Is we want as smooth a finish as possible because the metal and metal needs to be leak free. So there's the bulbous look. And now he's going to go ahead and run that pencil down there and it'll take and collapse the inside of that bulbous end of the tubing so that the ends of the tubing, the inner part, will fold down over an outer part, hence why I call it a double flare. And taking a look at this thing, I want to make sure that the shoulders of the flare are even all the way around the circumference. And you'll see that in a few moments, but that's a very nice double flare, just like the first one he had done. It's an acquired skill. Look at that. Nicely done. Oh, and the nut to lock it in place. You want that on the tube first because once you put the double floor in there, you're not getting that nut back on there. Okay, a little bit of compressed air being blown through there. So that if there is any kind of metal or any other form material inside a tube, it gets blown through. Now my guess is that once that retaining nut is up in place, Nick's going to go ahead and use the tubing bender once again to properly bend that tube so it goes into the cooling port. Now, later on, after he's done running this line, I think what I'll do is see if he would be willing to show what happens with some excess tubing when it gets bent without using a proper bender. Long, slow bends can be done without a tubing bender, but if you have something that's short and quick, you've got to use a tubing bender, otherwise you end up kinking the line. I can always tell when someone has not used a bender properly. And look at that. That's going to turn out really nice. Okay. Unspool and guide it in place. Okay, here we see the cooling line going from the front of the vehicle along the oil pan bell housing. And then it goes up into the ports for the pressure and the return side for the cooling lines. What Nick is going to do next is run some high pressure rubber tubing through the radiator support into the front of the car connect it into the oil cooler and then secure the oil cooler and then this part of the project will be done. Raiders album, and I've been doing it ever since. Okay, Nick has devised a small separator clamp that he's putting between the two cooling lines to stabilize them to keep the stuff from flopping around, from vibrating and also secure the way from places where it might rub against and actually end up getting a hole shaped through 
this metal tubing. But that's a really good idea. He's making another one up right now to put elsewhere. But my guess is he's going to probably put a few of these things in place along the way. Way up here in front, it's going to be really important to have that also. So keep the, ho the, 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 the hosing, the piping from rubbing against each other, other items and keep it from vibrating around. Okay, down here, this is the linkage that was added by Nick for the low car throttle valve linkage cabling. Here we have a lot of adjustment to make. There's a special tool that I'll show in a later video that we put in here to preset the initial throttle valve pressure. But the bracketing connects to the back of the Holly carburetor and sits down here and as the throttle goes back, the cable goes forward, putting tension on the cable that causes the throttle valve and the transmission to go ahead and activate and boost the line pressure as necessary to help adjust the shift points and also the clutch pressure and bend pressure necessary for this transmission to work properly. If this isn't adjusted correctly, it can cause some serious damage to the transmission. Transmission coolers are mounted with a special plastic retainer that presses from behind either through the radiator or air conditioning condenser cooling fins forward into the cooling fins of the oil cooler and then the retaining cap is put on in front of the oil cooler itself but that's how they look when they come all the way through and it only takes three maybe four of those things to be put in place to hold that cooler in position after which time the radiator will be bolted back in place it was Loosen to make room deep down between the radiator and the air conditioning condenser. Okay, the oil cooler is in position. And now what Nick is doing is he's routing the rubber high pressure hydraulic line from the front of the vehicle back to the nickel copper alloy tubing, cooling tubing that he put in place. There's two of these things that are going to be needed to be hooked up. But we have lots of room here. And the tubing itself was run through a factory radiator support hole that is already rolled over to prevent any sharp edges from cutting into metal or rubber wiring or hosing. So that's gonna work out pretty good.